to call this meeting to order of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group on <clears throat> September the 15th of 2024. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, the maker and creator of the heavens and the earth, the sky, the seas, and everything in it. Father, we come this morning just to say thank you. Thanking you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, the blessings that you've given us in the past, the blessings that you're giving us at this very present moment. And, oh, God, we thank you for the great things that you have in store for us. Because you said in your word that you know the plans that you have for us. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us a future and a hope. And for that, we say thank you. <coughs> and now, Father, we ask you to be with the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group as we take on the task of, of trying to uplift our people in Eastern North Carolina. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to ask um, our first vice, Carl Bond, if he would do the welcome. Again, I would say, like to say good morning to everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for taking time of your busy day to come and be with us here uh, at our monthly meeting. Again, I want to welcome you all, and I hope you'll be able to learn something from our meeting today. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Vaughn. So the objective of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group shall be to provide an organizational structure system for black Americans, minorities, and poor people. Encourage, promote, and involve members in all facets of government, provide a district forum associated with issues and concerns that affect members, create a communication network with existing human rights and civil rights organizations, assist counties with district structure with their plans, strategies, and programs, and create a monitoring system at the local state, <coughs> national, and international levels of government. At this time, um, we do not have uh, enough for quorum. So we, we will not be able to conduct an official business meeting at this time. So, so we, we can have discussions but we will not be able to take action on anything this morning. So our minutes, Secretary Sharp sent me the minutes. Did you have them? Okay. So I'm going to ask our Brother Bond if he could pull up those minutes. Okay. Uh, the minutes for my last meeting on August the 10th, 2024. The meeting was of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group met on Saturday, August the 10th, 2023. The meeting was called to order at 11.05 a.m. by President Stokes, Wesley Stokes. Prayer was given by Reverend Roy Gray, and the welcome was extended by Carl Bond, First Vice President. Uh, President Stokes read the objectives of the group Roll call was done by Janice Sharp, Assistant Secretary. 
There was nine cattle present. A quorum was announced. There was no additional uh, to the agenda, and it was approved. Minutes from the previous meeting were read by Janet Sharp, and they were approved as read. Uh, chairman, chairman remarks. President Stowe asked us to reach out to candidates who are not attending our meeting, and they can join in with Zoom or in person. Secretary Brown could not be in attendance because she attended a funeral. Dr. Portia, Dr. Portia Pope Shields of North Carolina Department of Health and Human Service came to represent her. She gave a COVID update and talked about vaccine needed for anyone over the age of five. Dr. Pope Shields shared information on Medicare expansion and some of its benefits. Reports, financial report. Uh, the financial report was given by Mavis Treasure, Mavis Hill Treasure. There was two deposit for the month. The PAC, there was no report. President Stowe asked that the committee to meet as soon as possible. We asked for volunteers to work on the committee for the gala. Minister uh, Mercedes Fournier volunteered to help. We are waiting on two draft letters, one to go to Governor Cooper asking for a pardon uh, for Stanley Jane, who was charged with embezzlement. The second letter to go to Congressman Don Davis. Carl Bond explained the reason for the letter. Unfinished business, the community engagement conversation was taking place on August 24th and will be spearheaded by Dr. Toms. It will deal with things going on in our community. New business, none. Announcements were given, and we asked to encourage others to call the election office to make sure their names are still on the roll, the names are being purged. There will be no further business. It was moved by Carl Bond and second by Vanessa Scott, third vice president, that the meeting be adjourned. President Weston Stoke, Betty Selby, uh, secretary, and Janet Sharp, assistant secretary. Thank you so much, Mr. Bond, for reading the minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Was there Vanessa Scott or was there Vanessa Smith? You said what? You said Vanessa Scott. I said, was there Vanessa Smith? Oh, man, Vanessa Smith. Excuse me, that's my mistake. Okay. All right. Also, it's, it said in the minutes that the discussion last month was about Medicare expansion. It was Medicaid and not Medicare. They're okay. frequently confused, but very different. Okay. Okay, with with that correction, with that correction, is are there any others? Okay, if not, the minutes will stand as corrected. Okay, thank you so much for that correction. So for for our um, for the chairman's remarks, uh, first of all. I want to thank those who attended the community engagement workshop. Uh, it, it was very informative, and I've, I've got some of the questions that were on the survey. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over all of it, but uh, this survey could be very impactful to Eastern North Carolina. So I'm asking all of you, uh, if there was a link. There was a link that you could go on and take the survey. We're also going to put that on our program for the gala. So it, when you get the program from the gala, on the back of it is going to be a, a scan bar that you can scan it and that will take you to the survey. I spoke with uh, Dr. Toms earlier and we had 30 responses to the survey, which, which is pretty good, but hopefully after the gala, we will get even more. Also, I received something this morning from Democracy Green, and Democracy Green is, is the, the group that is led by Lamisha Whittington, and she said, good morning, uh, Thanks to you folks who have returned, who have tested and returned the kit. Now, I, I know I've requested a kit. I got it and have sent it in. Have seen it. Did anyone else request the kit? 
Yes. For the for the lead. I got one for the temple. I didn't get the one for the lead. Okay, so you still not gotten yours. But the church has sent theirs in. Okay, and I okay, I'll let her know that you hadn't gotten yours. But it is important for folks who have received their test kits to test the water and return as soon as possible. She said, folks, please inform others in your household to expect the water kit if you requested one. So yours may be on the way. Feel free to contact us with any questions or concerns. We encourage you to attend Democracy Green's virtual works. Hop on water safety next step. After you've tested your water, what's next? And she sent a flyer, and I will submit the flyer to the secretary. That is it for my remarks this morning. And next we will call in our treasurer for the treasurer's report. Good morning. Uh, this is Major Hill. Uh, we have one paid out since last month. That was two hundred and forty dollars that was paid to Martin Community College for the facility for the um, that's not the um, um, May Mavis, we can't hear you. Your mouth are you going in and out? Okay, then I am having some technology issues, so I may have to defer to you, Mr. Stokes, to make that report. Okay. I we only had we only had one uh, check written for the month and that was to Martin Community College for the use of their facility of two hundred and forty dollars. That was the only expense for the month. Well, we had this problem the other night. Hers was going in and out. Yeah, she she she's having. Uh, oh, wait, he he was right trying to. Okay. All right. Uh, so we we will accept the financial report as given. Next on our agenda, it says uh, a report from Dr. Portia Pope, and I don't think Dr. Pope is on at this time. So I'm going to ask if he he will not mind, and I, I'm I'm just putting him on the spot. I'm going to ask uh, Butch Dancy if he would come up and introduce us to our next speaker, uh, the Sheriff of Edgecombe County. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to ask you to sit here so the people online can see you. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'm glad to be here. Uh, anytime we have a chance to to show knowledge and give knowledge is always a great thing. I want to speak briefly on, and I saw the agenda was the board and fitno. Fitno is, is excuse me. Oh, <laughs> thinking everybody know me. I'm Cleo Atkinson, Sheriff of Edgecombe County. Um, Man, I'm just glad to be here, man. I'm excited any chance I get to, to talk to the public and educate. Um, I've been the sheriff of Edgecombe County now going on seven years, going on eight years. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud to represent the citizens of Edgecombe County and uh, hopefully moving forward to, to from there. Uh, fentanyl crisis, when it first came about, and guys, I, I speak frank and I speak clear when opioids and all that came out, we looked at it as if it was a problem that didn't uh, hurt our communities, black and brown communities. But what I'm seeing the sheriffs and what sheriffs are seeing all across the state of North Carolina is uh, we are having several uh, people in our communities that are dying. 
uh, because of overdoses and the use of fentanyl. Uh, our babies are using these vapes, and I've actually had some young people in my church uh, that uh, that crushed some pills, their grandparents' pills, and put them in vapes, and they overdose. So this is a problem that is seriously affecting our community, and I want to speak swiftly because I don't want to take up most of you guys' time. But the border crisis, that is something serious, and we are in eastern North Carolina if I was any cartel, this is where I would set up shop. And let me tell you why, because in larger cities, they have the manpower and the law enforcement to combat some of these issues. But if I was cartel, and I'm not saying it to give them a free, a, a, a free pass, but normally in rural counties, cartels look at us because they look at your lack of manpower and law enforcement. And so when we're sitting in these communities, when we're speaking to our city council, we're speaking to our commissioners, we've got to get local law enforcement the resources that they need because I'm telling you guys, cartels are here. Uh, I used to be uh, a gang instructor for the state highway patrol, so I've been doing this for 20 years. But guys, it is getting worse. It's not getting better. And so I speak these truths so you fully understand what we are seeing. Um, when we start talking about the border, we are privileged as sheriff, privy as sheriffs to be able to see governmental things that the citizens don't see. Uh, these cartels with fentanyl, let me back up. China is a major supplier of fentanyl. So China is a major player right now, what we're seeing from an intel standpoint. What China is doing, they're making peel presses. So China is making peel presses and it's getting down to our southern border. So China is saying we're going to make these peer presses, presses as much as we can to destroy the interior and the fabric of America. And guess who is the fabric of America? Our children. If we can destroy America's children and working in partnership with the cartels, then that is what's happening. And so this stuff is major, major, major. So what we're seeing from a large governmental standpoint is we're focusing on the southern border. That's what our focus is. But cartels are getting smart. While we're building a wall on the south, they're flying serious gang members and cartel members to the north in Canada. And they're dropping down in the United States from the north. And we have no security up top. So while our focus, even in this election cycle, while our focus is in the south. And it is serious because they're killing. And we, we, we've seen video and this graphic video I share with Brother Dancer that I wanted to come in here and show video today, but it is so graphic. They're cutting off ladies' private parts and delivering them back home, uh, cutting off people live. They're stabbing them live, cutting their heads off. This stuff is something serious that we're dealing with that we don't have conversation in community. So when we hear the word cartels, they are something serious because that mindset is totally different. So while we're focused on the border, southern border, they're flying up north, and they're already in the United States. When we start looking at who's building construction, these large construction projects, so they're building construction by day, but at nighttime, it's a whole nother backdrop of what we're dealing with in law enforcement. So in eastern North Carolina, we've really got to be prepared because our babies are the targets. Our children are the targets. Overdoses happening every day. How I handle overdoses in Edgecombe County, so many sheriffs do the same thing. We had an overdose like homicide because that's how many we're getting right now. And I'm in a rural county. Eastern North Carolina, I try to be the voice of sheriffs and try to partnership with a lot of sheriffs because when you get east of I-95, it seems like everything slows down and it stops. And guess what? We, we cartels and, and, and drug pushers, they can open up the floodgates to Eastern North Carolina because you guys have gotten to fight for good professional law enforcement to slow down Fentanyl that's killing our young people in our communities. It's happening more than you see. And I was ignorant to the fact that at one time I thought, well, this is just a this is just happening in the white community. It is not. It is not. It's hitting us in the African American community. Our families are crying, loved ones are dying. Uh, we're taking these perk 30s and and, and to 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 kind of combat our depression and things that are going on in our lives, and we're losing our own people. Because we're not educating on the dangers of fentanyl. So I just want all of you to be mindful that 
this border crisis is affecting us right here at home. It is real. It is dangerous. It's more dangerous than we think. As a matter of fact, I want to show video today, but some of my intenders to share, are they ready for what you want to show them? And I had to second guess that thing. And I said, I don't think we are. Uh, because of what we're seeing that because these guys are so ruthless that they can come in our communities and they can be gone the next. And so the connection is even with our local gang members that we have in every city across eastern North Carolina. Um, if they're getting their supply from cartels. And they're not pushing that supply like they supposed to, then cartels can come in here in and out. We never know what hit us. That's how strong that entity is. So. The border crisis, it is serious. The, the intel that I've seen and so, so many sheriffs have seen across, seen across the state of North Carolina, it left us speechless. What we've seen and what's coming and let alone what's already here. So I just want everybody to understand as we even as we enter into November, into election cycle, we got regardless of who's the president. What we're seeing right now is scary. And we need everybody to be seriously concerned when we hear and we have that serious talk about the southern border, especially the bringing of fentanyl that's coming in our borders. I'm telling you, when I first got introduced to fentanyl with my narcotics team, I went to go touch it and my narcotics team grabbed me. I went to go pick it up and see what it was. That's no sheriff. This would knock you out. And all it takes to knock you out is a, is a, a pencil point touch. So a pencil point touch of fentanyl can overdose somebody. So guess what? We've got, especially around our area in Rocky Mount, we've got guys selling enough that will fill up the stadium of the Carolina Panthers. And all it takes is a pencil to stick to overdose you and kill you. But we've got guys that we've sent in the federal prisons that have sold enough to fill up the Carolina Panthers stadium. So it's supply and demand. It is really, really serious. We don't talk about it enough in, in sections and forums like this. We don't talk about it enough in, at church. We don't talk about it uh, uh, enough in schools, and our children are seeing it day by day. I also want to touch real quickly on mental health. Mental health is real. Uh, we've got to really take a serious look at this in our communities and all communities. I was at Greenville Behavior Health two weeks ago, and the doctors and the health professionals are saying, Sheriff, it's getting worse. It's not getting better. We don't have the resources in law enforcement to deal with mental health and all of this stuff play into each other. When people say, hey, we want to get rid of mental health instead of taking their medicine to make them feel like zombies and stiff in their joints and try to make them better. They get a hit of fentanyl and overdose. So they're trying to get a hit of something that'll make it go away instead of taking their medicine. So all this stuff coincides with one another. So mental health is real. Some of the doctors and professional staff at Greenwood, it's, it's interesting to hear them say it that sheriff is not getting any better. So we've got to really advocate to our state legislators. We need we need standalone builders in eastern North Carolina that's going to house mental health in the Piedmont and in the West because we need help. Law enforcement cannot control what we're seeing out here. We had an instance the other day, well, two nights ago in Edgecombe County, a uh, house full of folk. Guy was having a mental episode. I know I need to stay on the border stuff, but I'm here now. He had a mental episode. He shot in the house. He cleared the house. And he looked like us. And when my guys got, got there, we talked them now. Uh, we told them, so look, if you come to that door with the gun, that may not be a good idea. And we talked them now. Serious PTSD. And so, guys, mental illness in our community is serious, along with the fentanyl and also school safety while I'm here. School safety, guys, is a major concern for us as sheriffs across the state right now. Uh, our babies are going through a lot. Uh, the threats at our schools all in our community in eastern North Carolina <coughs> and across the nation. Uh, so those are major concerns for me as a sheriff. Fentanyl, the southern border, guys, I tell you, uh, we've got a fight on our hands. Uh, we've got a serious fight. Uh, dealing with cartels over the last 20 years, from what I've seen, it's, it hadn't gone anywhere, the pictures that I've seen. And hopefully I can get back to you guys, maybe sign a waiver at some point so I can show you guys the video and the videos that we've seen. It is graphic. You know, we, 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 we uh, the former president made a statement the other night about cats and dogs. 
And, you know, in law enforcement, we looked at it and people, they, they, you know, we, people looked at it and, 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 and they laughed and made memes and all that kind of stuff. But what we're seeing across the border and the graphics that I've seen, when those people get seriously hungry enough, and I even talked to some military guys, and it's nothing, nothing that I can confirm and back up with this, but I even talked to some military guys that say you get hungry enough in the military, you eat anything, whether it's a cat or a dog. But what we're seeing at the border when their loved ones are dying and guys, you know, and I looked at that thought process the other night about cats and dogs, how ignorant that statement was. It's not too far-fetched what we're seeing at the border. So even when loved ones are dying and they know they're dying and they can't bury them, what we're seeing at the border is it's not the cats and dogs that are concerned. They may be eating each other. And these are the kind of things that is so serious down there on that border that is scary. Uh, what's going on down at that border? So even in government, there's some things government don't want you to know and don't want you to hear, just like the military. I'm a transparent guy everywhere I go. The people need to know what's happening because when it hits your neighborhood, it's too late. It's too late. So those are serious concerns that we are seeing. I would say pray for every community to pray that law enforcement and government can get you guys what you need, get you the information that you need. Uh, but cartels are serious. Uh, they don't really care about your children or your community. It's about supply and demand. They eat their own. What I mean by eat their own, they would destroy their own to get their supply out to destroy your community. Right now in Mexico is two cartels that are really, really serious. One is a senior group and one is a new group. This new group is something serious because they're battling the senior group. And I don't want to call their names right now, but it's a senior group and a new group. And they are battling each other for territory over here in the United States. That's how serious this is. And you guys know how it is with new groups, even in our own communities and the new generation. But guess what? The senior cartel group over there in Mexico is shaking their heads like, what have we got in our hands? So there's a new group that's saying, hey, we know how to work technology. We know how to send guns to the United States. We know how to send fentanyl to the United States. We got we we can take over this senior group. So we're going to supply and demand in the United States. And that's how serious this is with the southern southern, southern border and cartels right now. <laughs> Any questions or thought process? Uh, good morning. Good morning.
They're raising themselves. Sure. So they raise themselves in the street. Yes. And they're fascinated by guns. Right. And they're fascinated uh, with the power in certain situations. Right. So, yeah, this, thank you for bringing it to the table. It needs to be aired more. Um, and it does need to be an issue that we stop turning our back. Our schools need to hear about it. Our churches need to realize your communities are suddenly having changes that are going to affect us. Right. And, and, and thank you for being candid and honest. Uh, and like I said, man, all our opinions, even myself, man, guys, as a leader, we're human, man. But discussion is great. And I appreciate you with myself and Sheriff Stone. We're scheduled to go to the border next month because this stuff means so much to me that I need to see it for myself. I don't need anybody to tell it to me. Sheriff Stone, Nash County Sheriff, have been out there about two or three times. And so I asked a request. I want to go out with him so I can see this. But you're exactly right. A concern of mine uh, is uh, young people. And overdoses happen in all communities, of course. It's happening in all communities. But guess what? That cartel does not care what that community looks like. They don't care about their community. They don't care about African Americans. They don't care about the white community. It's all about money and supply and demand. And at all costs, if they don't supply that fentanyl, if they don't supply it, somebody dies. That is that is that in somebody dies, whether you overdose or somebody dies who don't supply it or deliver it up. So you're right. We've got to fight on our hands uh, and we've got to have conversations like this. This room needs to be standing room only because it is affecting all of us. And it is affecting even law enforcement when we go to these overdoses and needles of, of, of fitting on their needles are still stuck in their arms. And so mentally, we need the help because we are seeing it all the time. And it's hard for me as a sheriff to keep going to families and say, hey, look, this is your loved one. They are past or deceased. That, that's mentally draining. They at week after week that we have to do this. So uh, that's why the fight at the border is so strong, because it eventually gets to Wimston and Tarboro. Two of our major suppliers in our area right now, Scotland Neck and Henderson. Now, I know every, every area got their own supplier. But Henderson is a major supplier to the eastern North Carolina. Don't ask me why we've been trying to figure it out. We've been trying to investigate. We've been trying to have our boots on the ground. But Henderson and Scotland Neck are our major suppliers in eastern North Carolina, at least to Edgecombe County. I don't know what's east of Edgecombe County. So they are major suppliers of fentanyl right now for us. And we're, we, we, we're doing all we can to keep that out of our community, especially eastern North Carolina. Of course, you have I-95 and these major corridors of 64. But it is major supply and demand right now. We just want people to understand that if you really see it, and it's your family. If it's your family that's a supplier. Guys, I'm telling you, we are going after the person. We treat all our homicides, overdose homicides from fentanyl, well, overdoses from fentanyl like homicides. And I'm going after somebody's family member if another love, if they sold this nasty drug and kill somebody. And that's how serious it is right now because we're dropping in Edgecombe County in one week or well, probably within 48 hours a couple months ago. I had about 10 overdoses in less than 48 hours. And so then when I figured out that my major supplier was coming out of Pitt County, I had to put all my, my, my uh, resources on the southern part of Edgecombe County. I said, I want every car that's coming out of Pitt County. I need to know who this is. And lo and behold, we stopped the supplier coming in at 430 every morning on the southern part of Edgecombe County. That's why everybody sleep. He was smart. But he was coming in every morning at 430 in the Edgecombe County, dropping off this deadly drug. And so those are the kind of things that we've got to do to outsmart. And it's happening in every county. I just want our community to be informed and that it is it's way more serious. The government, get, government gives you a little bit. But as sheriffs and, and leaders, we're seeing the heartbreak of what's happening down there at that border. And what's, what's really happening is Chinese nationals and the cartels, they're coming in there while focus is on the southern border. They're coming in from the north, and they're already here because all our resources are in the south. So while that continues to be conversation, now we as law enforcement and leaders across America, like how do we handle the north? Because they're dropping down from New York and that Canadian border into Idaho, into Seattle, Washington, 
and nobody's paying any attention. The next thing you know, they set out major fentanyl shops and gun shops. They're selling guns to our teenagers left and right. People say, well, how do these teenagers get guns? Well, if we're not paying attention to what's going on up north and everything down south, they're bringing in guns and fentanyl left and right. And I'll tell you, it's working law enforcement day and night. But I say to anybody just listen to me, support your local law enforcement. Support your city council to make sure law enforcement gets what they need. And I'm so transparent that I had a budget the last year in Inscombe County to fight fentanyl, and my budget got caught and cut in half to fight drugs. Mm-hmm. So I'm not the only one. So the citizens are saying, hey, what are you doing to combat this drug? Well, I can't do too much if I don't have the money to buy drugs from the drug dealers to build federal cases. And let me tell you, here in, in, in Inscombe County, I'm not here in Inscombe County, but I'm in Inscombe County. If I got a drug dealer that we've arrested time and time again, I send him through the federal court system. So that federal court judge, he don't need a jury. He just need the evidence. And guess what? He give them years so we can get these people that continue to sell drugs in our neighborhoods. So I bypass the state court system and I send them to the federal court system so we can get these people off the streets. So they're smart. They, they, they spend their wheels in the state court system. They get stuff dismissed. Uh, they get stuff continued. And they play with our state court system. But that federal judge and that federal uh, district attorney, federal uh, ADA is not going to play with them. So we figured that out as sheriffs. Let's get these continue these same drug dealers that are destroying our neighborhoods. Let's get them to the federal court system. Let's get them some time. And so we can eradicate what's happening in our communities. So, so much. And I like to be transparent that we've got to work on as leaders that our community got to understand what's happening to us. Fight for good law enforcement in your community. Fight for what's right. If we're not doing it right as leaders, remove us. It's okay. That's the power, voting power of the people. But if they are doing it right, fight for them to get the resources they need to get this deadly fentanyl out of your neighborhoods. If some eastern North Carolina communities are like mine, I only have three drug detectives. Now, what are three drug detectives going to do when I just told y'all we got one drug dealer that's filling up the Carolina Panther Stadium with fentanyl. And so I know in eastern North Carolina, some of them don't have one or two. So therefore, fight for those communities. Talk to your city council. Talk to your commissioners to make sure the local law enforcement got what they need to combat this fentanyl crisis because it is here and it's, uh, it's disheartening. And we're going as hard as we can to help save some of your family members. Anything else? I know I talk I a, a lot. I got a question yes, to ask you. Uh, since you said that, do y'all have, do Eastern North Carolina have a uh, narcotic task force from each, I mean, where they come together, like Martin, Pitt, Green, uh, Berte, Hertford? Do y'all have a task force where all those come together and be sure that y'all are working together to be sure to keep this drug, these drugs out of our counties? We do if the manpower allows it. See? And that is the that is the thing. All that sounds good. You, know, you could put together Eastern North Carolina Task Force, maybe one for men's cone, two for men. All that sounds good. And the reason why I say this, and I'm so transparent, all of that sounds great. But if you don't put your money where your mouth is to support local local law enforcement, it will not work. That's how secure I am with this stuff. It will not work. And so what happens is if Sheriff Manning here in, in Martin County says, Sheriff, we're having a problem here in Martin County, that we can we can send them two deputies from Edgecombe, and they all work together anyway. We can send two from Edgecombe, Sheriff Dash can send two from, from Pitt, and guess what? We can we can work together. They can send two from the SBI, but eventually they're going to have to go back to where they came from because you don't have the resources. And I can tell you guys this, and we all know how we battled through when and I can tell people all the time how there was a stint during uh, where, where law enforcement were killing, murdering uh, innocent citizens. This is what it is. It's how real I talk. And then we had law enforcement getting assassinated. What happened during that and during that COVID? Nobody's knocking our door down to get in law enforcement. And so that hurts, too. And that's why I tell citizens, fight for good professional law enforcement. Nobody's knocking our door down saying, hey, we want to do what you do 24 hours a day, 
for low pay. We want to do what you do. Go fight the fentanyl drug dealers and the cartels. Nobody's knocking our door down. And so somehow we've got to figure that out. And if you got good local law enforcement and good uh, professional law, notice I said professional, not just law enforcement, but you need professional people. And in order to get professional people, you've got to pay them. Because I don't want just a cop coming to my door. I don't even know what a cop is. You want somebody professional that's going to come meet your needs when they arrive. And so if they're looking for other professions and you've done trained them in Martin County for eight years, now you got a six-month guy, he ain't going to know what to do. And so the community loses. Okay? That's a good question. So we do work together to answer it fully. We do work together. But eventually, if I send two to Martin County, I'm going to make sure they come on back home to Edge Cone and say, we got stuff to do in Edge Cone. And that's what happens. That's a good question. Sure. Yes, sir. I, I, I'll count. My county uh, is a member of a task force. Mm -hmm. And my complaint to the sheriff was when he said, this is what we're going to do, and the county gave him some money to do it, is that don't don't come in Washington County. Oh, I didn't mean to say my county. It's okay. But, but don't come in, and the only thing you arrest are my brothers and my brothers. You, you, because it's a heavy conversation. Is that correct? I I don't want you to just just single them out and they're the little man. Can I tag it because because my soul is is jumping up and down. Here's what you're talking about, and I've seen this over my law enforcement career. And this is how transparent I am. If you catch me with a little bit of drugs, law enforcement, I may have just bought a little bit. You say, hey, man, you, we're going to charge you and it's going to mess your record up. I can't get a job. The same scenario happens to the person that don't look like you. Now, it's, Sheriff, let's get them some help and don't charge them. Oh, brother, you're talking to real. And that's why I don't play these games, because if you ask the question, I've seen it. You are exactly right. And that's why we've got to have these conversations in communities and the pastors and the preachers got to be on point. Because when a person, I've seen this, when a person looks like you get stopped with a dime bag or something else, you get charged. You go through the system, it's hard for you to get a job. Somebody who don't look like you gets it. Sheriff, they just had a little bit. They're battling. Let's get them some help. And I've seen what you're talking about. So you're exactly right. How, and I, I would suggest, once, once again, as elected official and elected sheriff, you stay on his or her's back. Because that's what we are elected for, to make sure that we're not doing the practice that I've seen over my law enforcement career, and I've seen that even as the sheriff. So what you're saying is fact, okay? And that is a heck of a question. And, and so elected leaders like myself got to watch that. We got to monitor that. We've got to call our deputies' hands and uh, 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 stop that. Don't do that because I've seen that. And let me give you something else that I that I do as a sheriff. Um, we When we write tickets, I check every ticket, and my chief deputy uh, check most of our warrant services, stuff like that. We take the time. Every ticket that comes across that my deputies write in Edgecombe County, I check them to make sure they're fair and make sure certain demographic of people are not just getting stopped. Now, I do that on my own because I want to see it. I want to make sure. And guess what? If I see that, I have a mandatory supervisor meeting. Or if I see something that shouldn't have been charged, I say, hey, was it, do you think this is fair? And we have a long talk with the district attorney. So some things from the top, and you're right, it starts with me and it starts with that, Sheriff. We've got to make sure that we are we have the best practices in place when those drug, drug funding is coming to, to make sure. And guess who? Guess who oversees that sheriff's office? The people. The people. The greatest thing about a sheriff is I don't work for anybody. I don't have a city manager. I don't do any of that. But I work for the people. Every four years, I get evaluated. If the people don't like it, I get evaluated and they fire me. So guess what? You keep having a voice. 
You keep speaking your voice. That's what makes us better. That's what keeps us on our toes is the voice that you said when you're getting funding for a task force. How is it being spent? That's big. It's big. It's a great question. All of y'all. Just, just a little off, off subject. A little is I, I served as a commission, county commission. Yes, sir. Years. Awesome. And I went to court one day and I watched back to back a young black man had been arrested. His dad was there and his dad asked the judge for leniency and the judge sent, sentenced him. Mm-hmm. Not 20 minutes later, a young white man came up same charge, and the daddy said, Judge, I've already punished him. And the judge said, case dismissed. Can I share something with you? It's big. When I was a state trooper, I went into the courtroom myself. Same scenario. And it still bothers me today. But this stuff belongs to the hands of the people. That judge. That judge. He's elected just like me. And they come wow us in our communities. And we don't take a stand and we don't remember those things. But as a state trooper, that same scenario happened to me. The same charge I charged a brown person, same charge from an accident, a collision. Guilty. Four points on his license. Man, it's pretty tough. And I was a young guy, but I knew something wasn't right. Same guy comes up that didn't look like the brown person, admitted worse stuff in his collision, Left the scene of the accident where the brown person stayed. Two separate incidents. He was arrogant, nonchalant, and the judge looked at me and said, I want to give him a break. Mm. I was 24 years old. It sent a bad spirit across my body. I went back to the office and told my supervisor, this is not right. And as I learned over the years, I learned that judge is elected just like I am now as a sheriff. And we allow this in our courts where the people and the power belongs to the people. And until we fully realize that, sir, that the voting power belongs to us. And I challenge my people across Edgecombe County. I have an open door policy. Anybody can reach me in Edgecombe County. 252-885-6467. If I'm a public official, you need to know how to get in contact with me because you elected me and I work for the people and I enjoy working for the people. But if you don't have elected officials, personal cell phone number, something is wrong. If you don't have judges, personal cell phone number because we vote them, something is wrong. And so that's just how I feel about it because I work for one of the greatest careers in the world working for the people and the citizens of Edgecombe County. But when you said that, there's always always a story behind it. This is happening in almost every courtroom in America, and nobody challenges it. And we see it in law enforcement all the time, and it hurts. It really hurts. I thank you for that, sir. These are the strong conversations we've got to have in order to make sure make sure all people, and especially black and brown <clears throat> people, Fully get that we can hear their voices and understand they're not lying to us. They're telling mm-hmm. us the truth. I Man, I can sit here all day long, but thank you guys. These, this, this means a lot to me to sit in an intimate conversation and have an intimate conversation amongst people asking good questions. Thank you. Now you're talking about on the local level, but at the uh, border, yeah. uh, who monitors the border? Federal government. And do they have enough? No. No, like I said, nobody's knocking down to for local, state, or federal government. Uh, when people see what we really see, they can't take it. Let me give you guys this, and I'm going to stand up so I can get ready to go, because if not, I keep talking. Let, let me say this right here. Once people see what we see, what I want to show you guys, we hire them and say, hey, man, this ain't for me. 
when they really understand how dirty this can get and the people we've got to go after, we hire good people. But after 24 and 48 hours, they said, we can't take this. We didn't know y'all went through all of this for so much little money. Let me say this right here. One of the things I'm going to talk to our young people, let me sit down for a second. One of the things I'm going to talk to our young people about what happened with the Miami Dolphins situation with law enforcement. That whole interaction still bothers me on both sides. On both sides. For a long time, all I did was train state troopers how to survive. The mindset, how to survive. But what bothered me about the pro suits, the, the, the Miami Dolphins situation was, one, that was a speeding incident. Okay? And on the back end, all we saw when the initial came out was the pro player laying on the ground. Media messed with our minds and our, our communities. All they saw was a pro football player laying on the ground. But oh no, with law enforcement, we said, well, let's see what, the, what happened before then on that body camera. And the best thing that I've ever happened to me in Edgecombe County when I came to Edgecombe got them body cameras. Because the truth lies in that video. And I was able to see what the deputy was doing and I was able to see what the citizen was doing. Guess what? Sometimes it didn't jive. All I'm saying is, when the initial stop happened, let's do what we're asked to do. If it's rolling your window down, roll the window down. If it's stepping out the car, step out the car. It's okay. And sometimes we just got to do that. And I've been in those situations where you just be just as nice as you want to be and still no results. So all I'm saying is even in that instance, those are training instances for our children where the officer goes on administrator leave with his fifty or sixty thousand dollars when 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 the pro athlete is allowed to play making millions. Now in my book, make make both of them go home. But it ain't about what's right, it's about money. So we should we should use that incident as a teaching moment. If you go home, then guess what? Uh, Roger Goodell, the owner of the NFL, you need to make the football player go home till we can figure it out. But it's about money. Okay? Thank you. Love you guys. Appreciate you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. Okay? Appreciate you. Will you be willing to come back to do this again? You made me sit down again. I tell you, I like to have a good time. Yes. I, I love my people. Okay. But you are exactly right. And, and I would love to bring back some sheriffs in here with me. Okay. Because my whole thing about it, and, and let me say it's Craven County Sheriff in Newburgh, he has a great presentation on these gummies that children are getting. And I'm telling you, let me share this with you, those gummy things you see. These Middle Eastern stores, man, I tell you what's fact. They're setting up these stores, their military bases. Now, ain't that a problem? Yeah, that's a problem. So we're trying to figure out, are they setting up these stores to have intel on military bases? Okay? But these gummies that our children are buying, that's got marijuana in them, these children are passing out in middle schools and high schools. We've seen it at our local high schools. They have these Oreo boxes and cereal boxes. They got gummies in them. He's got one of the best presentations across the state. He's right here in New Bern. Uh, they're confiscating. They're going after those. So he's doing a great job down in Craven County. But you know what we found out? We have representatives, whether they be senators or representatives, that own manufacturers and the stores of these things. So how can we eradicate something by law that are hurting our children when you got people that are high up, that's got factories or warehouses, not factories, but warehouses, that's storing this stuff. So we're kind of like law enforcement, we're pushing against people that are making laws. We want to keep people safe, but how can we until the people stand up and say enough is enough? But yes, I love to get that Craven County share. He got, he's got a, in the West, that presentation, it's no video. He's bringing stuff that you can see that's happening. We, we had an incident at one of our high schools. Thank you for that. We had an incident at one of our high schools where one of our teachers brought an Apple Jacks uh, plastic case. She bought them from the that little bin store, little Walmart bin stores or something like that. She bought she just bought the, the package from the bin store. Well, she put her own wrap candy in, in the Apple Jacks thing. 
So she put wrapped candy, which is legal. But on the back of it, when the children got home on the back of the Apple Jacks, it had marijuana leaves on the back of the on the back of the uh, Apple Jacks thing. You know? So guess what? Our teachers don't even know what they're looking at. So she bought it in good faith because she said, I didn't need some something to put the candy in, like Halloween candy. But this just happened at the beginning of the school year. I said, something to put the candy in. But so she bought wrapped candy, put it in it. But when the parents got they looked in the back and said, hey, man, it's got marijuana. So we had to do a full investigation. See, I didn't know that. So even the teachers and the principals are educated what our children are seeing. But the children understand fully what's going on. But our teachers and our principals don't have a clue what's going on. But yes, I'd be glad to come back. And I think when I come back, I need to bring other sheriffs in eastern North Carolina, not across the state, because I'm concerned about eastern North Carolina, what's pushing back from I-95 back so they can tell you what's going on in our community. Okay? I hope I said a mouthful, um, but you're right. I love to contact that Craven County Sheriff. He can show you guys what you guys are seeing in your stores that's killing and hurting our children. And he's right next door. One more thing. I need your need you give your telephone number. Oh okay. man, it's real. Like, ask him like, oh, they from Edgecombe County. That's what I want. No, they're not from yeah. Edgecombe. Well, tell them they're they from Edgecombe County. County. They don't. They need to contact that local sheriff. No, no they listen. want you. No, listen. Two five two, two five two, eight eight five, six four six seven. Two five two, eight eight five, six four six seven. Do me a solid. If I don't know you, just text me first to say, hey, I'm such and such. I heard you at the civil group talking. I'm such and such. And that way I can call you back and I can have an understanding. Because, you know, all this spam stuff we got, if I don't see your number, man, I don't. I don't but if you text me, I can I can link up and uh, go from there. But 252-885-6467. Every day we got to laugh, but we can be serious and handle business in our community at the same time. Good stuff. Thank you. I know that smile means step away from this chair. That's <laughs> Thank you, Sheriff. I can Thank see you, sir. Coming. We appreciate it. I appreciate uh, what you got. have you again. Good message. Yes. And we want you to. It's real. We got to have an honest talk. Yes, we do. That's what. We just got to have, have an honest talk. talk. I got to get to Rocky Mountain. All right. Have a safe trip. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service. Well, please feel free to move to East Coast County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a presentation that was. I wish more people was online, but uh, we're not going to stop there. We're going to have him again. So uh, next time, maybe we have a full, full house. Also, Brother Stoke, it's back to you. Let me give you a name. Y'all hear him, but he's putting shit in there. I had it for my, uh, he's not a preacher. Don't believe it. Yeah, but he, I, but he, but so, I had it for my men's day for the last five years. But he, <laughs> he, he speaks like a preacher. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. so I'm going to get him to do my men's day program next year. You already lined up, Doc. I got you. I got you next year. Yeah. Thank you. Have a blessed, safe trip. He preaches the word. When he preaches, don't preach. I'm telling you now. I'm telling you. Because he preaches the word. I thought it. That spirit. You could sense that spirit. You could sense it. The only thing you know is that the pastor did all that. Wow. And all day somebody came. Say what now? But they got a new preacher now. Oh. All day somebody came for you. Uh huh. Uh-huh. This guy been there all them years. And we know it ain't. We'll turn it back over to our president and brother Stokes. Mr. That, Stokes is on you. That was so powerful. Folks, that was so powerful what we just heard. <laughs> uh, we're going to have him back. Um, I know we've, we've, we've got a busy schedule and agenda, but in a couple of months, we want to have, have him back. That, well, that what we need to do is get him as a motivational speaker for, for uh, get out the book. Yeah. Okay. That's how I was hoping we have a speaker for the thing on the 28th, but y'all want to hear from him. But I was going to tell y'all we really need to get him here. Okay, we, we will well, definitely... I was going to get him to speak when I was going to hold it in Edgecombe County. Mm-hmm. He, he was going to be the speaker. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that was powerful. And I can see why he's continued to be elected, re-elected. He, he's, he's got that personality as well as strength there. So we will now, uh, our unfinished business 
is, well, uh, Brother Dancy called me yesterday, and he, he, his question was, what is our opinion on the citizens only amendment that's going to be on your ballot in November? So I pulled up. I've got our report. Okay, read it, Rabbi. This is a referendum of the constitutional amendment. It says, constitutional amendment to provide that only a citizen of the United States who is 18 years of age and otherwise possess the qualification for voting should be entitled to vote at any election in this state. Okay, so so I, I found some information. This is on Axios, uh, and it says why it matters. Immigration has been and will continue to be a key issue in this election cycle, and Republican lawmakers move to put it on the on the ballot will keep it front and center. Between the lines, already only citizens are allowed to vote in North Carolina. And whether or not a majority of voters approve the amendment in November, this won't change. So it's already a law that you can. It is already a federal law that no citizen from outside of the United States, if you're not a registered citizen, you cannot vote in our elections. This is just something that the Republicans are putting up front. Uh, so one, one person said that, I feel like we're chasing a problem that doesn't exist. This was Pricey Harrison, who, who is in our North Carolina State House said that. Uh, it, it just seems to be they're asking us to get into something that is strictly political, that whether we, it is already a law. Now that, what Representative was, it was the way Republicans confused it because of the election time, making them think about they doing something. But now I also read where, I say for instance, dancing a little louder to make sure. I also uh, read somewhere that if you got maybe two immigrants and neither one of them are American, you know, once you had a child over here, that child will automatically be a citizen. A citizen. But I think that's what they're trying to change from what somebody told them. But that's going to be hard to change too. Because if they're born here, it means they'll be a citizen. So I'm just saying we need to make sure that we educate people on how we need to vote. Because I had did my ballot when it was online and put it out there. So I got a call yesterday. The guy was like, we don't need to vote for it. I said, but it sounds like it ain't going to change nothing. So I have a problem with changing if the majority, you know, but I think we need to educate the people on it and see which way to go. I think Project 2025 is where the changes will come, not the amendment. So I don't know. Yeah. It's just something that, that they're putting in out to, to cause division. Now, I did find some research that says some states, some states, if you're not, if you, if you live in the area, you have property that you can vote if you are not a citizen of the United States. But if you are a taxpayer in that state, you can vote on local issues. You can vote in local elections, but not any federal or state elections. So I, I don't understand why this is on the ballot, but we just have to know who we're playing with. And we'll do, we'll do more research and we will just let people know maybe in our next meeting of how, where the civic group, because this isn't this is a partisan, so we can we can issue yeah, that's something that's on that. Maybe we need to get with an attorney. With who? Uh, uh, an attorney. Well, we got an in-house attorney. Now, Matt, you had something you want to say? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, they want to pass laws like this to support the false narrative that non-citizens have been voting and there has been widespread voter fraud. Whenever they put something like that on the ballot, it makes people think, oh yeah, that's been happening. I heard that that's been happening. We need to vote on this so that uh, that can't happen anymore. And we know that it's been proven many times that that widespread, air quote, voter fraud that they talked about did not in fact happen. It's just a ploy. Thank you, Dr. I mean, Reverend Matt. Thank you for your comment. And you're correct. Uh, they see this movement where we're getting more Democrats out to register to vote this time, and they want to find a way to be sure they stop people of color from voting so they can remain in power. Brother Stokes, anything else on that? No. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else got anything they want to say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he was talking about AI uh, that's out now. You've got to be very careful with AI because AI can be used to uh, promote information that's, in, that's not correct. I'll give you a prime example of what uh, example we're talking about. Um, Donald Trump put on his social media page that uh, Taylor Swift had endorsed him. Uh, and by using AI, he posted on it on his page, and then when she came out officially and backed uh, Vice President Harris, he said, "I don't, I didn't like her anyway." So those are the things we got to be careful and watch. Where AI is putting out false information, the media is putting out a false information. So we got to be careful about who we listen to and what we we listen and. Research. We got to do our own research. Uh, just don't rely on what someone else says. Do your research. Yes, that is a challenge for our young people. Like to use that a whole lot. So we got to be careful that with that. And, and again, that's one of the things like I've always said. When stuff go out like that, we need to make a statement. Yeah. And so people will know. But if the people don't hear but one side, that's all they don't believe. Yeah, yeah that's true. Us, but yeah. everybody. Everybody. And everybody. Our organization, we got to counteract this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I said, I, I originally said by our next meeting, but we, we're going to need to meet. And and have a statement by the 28th that we can announce it at, at the gala where we stand with that. Yeah. yeah. And, and this leading up election time, we gotta do what we gotta do. If we gotta do it every day. Everybody might can't be involved, but stuff like this to me is serious. Yes. And we gotta work on it. Yes. Yes. Can't wait. All right, the only other thing that we have on our agenda is is the, the planning for our gala. Um, I, will, I will yield to uh, our first vice, Vaughn, for our information on that. Okay, um, our gala is going to be taking place on September 28th at 3 p.m. at the E.J. Hayes Alumni Center uh, is going very well. We got the program all together. Uh, we have uh, numerous of candidates from the Canada State coming. We have a members from on the national, state, and local level that will be there. Uh, so we want you to come out. The tickets are $25, but everybody say, 
you raise the money, but we're having a dinner for you also. So you come, you listen to the candidate, you get a good meal, and you get a chance to shake hands and meet and greet. The candidates that's going to be on the ballot this year are, like I said, we're nonpartisan. We invite everybody on both sides, but we only had one side that really want to show up. So come out and hear them, because you need to put the face with the name so you know when you go to the ballot who you're going to be voting for. Uh, we got a good plan program. I don't want to give the program out just yet, but we got it all set. And like I said, uh, on that day, you get your own program. And on the back of the program, we will have a uh, CRQ code with the list that you go and get your information about uh, what Dr. Tongs was talking about. And just for example, here's some of the people that probably will be is supposed to be there. Lieutenant Governor Ralph, uh, Rachel Hunt, North Carolina uh, Auditor Jessica Holmes, uh, North Carolina Commission of Agriculture, Sarah, what she called, Tabor, uh, North Carolina Commission of Labor, Braxton Winston, on uh, NC State uh, Secretary Elaine Marshall, North Carolina Public, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mo Green, uh, NCCT, uh, North Carolina Court of Appeal, Carolyn Thompson, North Carolina State District 2, uh, Senate uh, Tom, T. Tom, T. Davis, uh, and North Carolina Senator District, was, that's District 1, yeah, District 1, Susan Scott, North Carolina House of Representative District uh, 1, Susan Sawin, and then the North Carolina District Court Judge, District 2, C3, Jason Williams. Those had all committed to be here on that day, so please come. Uh, invite anybody else uh, to come that you know. Uh, if you need a ticket, contact any officer of the uh, civic group, and uh, there should be a representative from each of our counties, and they will have tickets for you. Uh, with that being said, uh, Brother Stokes, um, that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Bond, for that report. And, and as he did emphasize, uh, the tickets are $25. A meal will be served. We, we've heard rumors that we were charging people to come meet the candidates. No, we aren't. The, the Civic Group is making no profit on this. But it is so important. We feel that it is so important that we bring the candidates to Eastern North Carolina, that our citizens will have an opportunity to talk with them about issues that concern them. I can't help with responses on elections and political figures. Right he was, if we were to make a profit, which we are not, it's work to be done. Yeah. And people don't work at the polls and stuff like that. So uh, they need to change that mindset. If they're going to get out and work and help us, and we, you know, we can't get people to work. People got to take off work. So that mindset about we charging, no, that's not the case. But if we work, yes. it takes money to get out to vote. Yes, yes. And today, folks only want to do something if they get paid. That's right. That's um, true. We're, we're trying to do phone banking. And folks want to know, first thing they ask is, right. how, how much do I get? And don't even talk about canvassing. Lord have mercy. <laughs> I got one announcement. I got one announcement to make. Uh, the Northampton County NAACP Freedom Fund Banquet is being held on Saturday, uh, September 21st at, uh, at the Bishop Wayne I. Weldon's Wetchell's Community Center. The tickets are thirty dollars and can be purchased on Eventbrite, or you can call two five two five three two six two seven two. So I like that last statement. <laughs> well, yes, it does. It costs to sponsor the event, so yeah. you know we have to pay for it. Yes, yeah. it does. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Is it anything else to come before? the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but you can tell me.
Shelly Knows and Della Sally are capable. Um, well, she asked the utensil thing. Daddy called. Daddy had called me um, about the decorator. Um, what she would do versus what the caterer would do. The caterer had agreed to do the utensil. Okay, and she said that she would do it for just a small fee of an additional fifty. Okay, that's for um, the clear plateware, clear silverware, clear cup. You know, hold on yours for that. Which that puts a few dollars more into her budget, her requirement, which she was at um, 1725. That takes her to 1775. Um, but that's her total cost. And she had asked that we um, provide her with half the cost up front, which that's like 887.50 for her uh, for her half. So just wanted to address that with you all. Okay. Okay. All right. You'll have that before you leave here today. And she said that she's sure she will be well. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Is is there anything else? All right. We will accept the motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. All right. All those opposed, meeting stands adjourned. Thank you all so much.